Earl Thomas made some wild comments about his former team in the Baltimore Ravens, and Stephen A. Smith continues bashing Lamar Jackson. All that and more coming up next on a bonus episode of Locked on Ravens. You are Locked on Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into another edition of Locked On Ravens, where daily Baltimore Ravens podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Ostreicher of Ravens, where I'm here with you on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you so much for being here today, making Locked On Ravens both a part of your day and your first listen each and every single day for an available for you all podcasting platforms that includes in video form on YouTube where you can like and subscribe to the channel and in audio form where you can follow along and subscribe over there as well. Five days a week plus more of daily Ravens coverage both ways if you want to watch or listen you're not missing out on any content regardless of how you consume this show. Today's bonus edition of Locked on Ravens is Brought to you by FanDuel. You can start the season with a bigger turn on FanDuel. New customers can place a $5 bet, and you'll get started with $150 in bonus bets. If you win your first $5 bet, visit FanDuel.com to get started. A lot to dive into today on this bonus edition of the show. Wasn't sure where the headlines were going to take us, what we are going to have to talk about, but... Man, Friday was plentiful in terms of storylines, headlines pertaining to this Ravens team, a name that I haven't really thought about in a while, Earl Thomas. He had a lot to say on Justina Anderson's podcast about his time in Baltimore, some wild things. We'll talk about that in the first part of the show. Then Stephen A. Smith, who we talked about a lot on yesterday's show with Sam and Joku, so if you haven't checked that out, be sure to check out that episode. He continued on bashing Lamar Jackson, but Cam Newton came to his defense in Lamar. Then finally, we'll dive into the meaning of Ravens and Steelers. Obviously, the rivalry has meant so much to both teams over the years, and that obviously has shifted as the years go by. So we'll dive into that in the final part of the show. And if you're here in video form, I decided to get the hair cut super, super short. I'm not sure I've ever gotten my hair as short as this ever, but I decided to do this, and I want to see if this works. I want to see if we can go now a couple months for me without cutting the hair up until hopefully the Ravens win the Super Bowl. I will make that sacrifice. All right, we got it super short, so we have a little blank canvas to work with here. Lost a lot of poof. I had a lot of poof in the hair. We lost the poof. But the goal here is if the Ravens keep on winning, and I'm not cutting the hair, I'm going to take full credit for it. So if they win the Super Bowl and I don't cut the hair until February, that's a long time to not cut hair. I'll get su- I'll get all that poof back. I'll take credit for the Ravens winning the Super Bowl. So we got it short to hopefully grow it out as the Ravens win. So I want to see if it works. And if it does, you you know I'm taking credit for it. And we can revisit that conversation. So just wanted to get that out there so everybody is aware. But let's talk about these Earl Thomas comments because really there are a lot of places we could start. Honestly, it's kind of hard to pick a place. But Earl Thomas, again, went on Josina Anderson's podcast, The Exhibit. So if you haven't checked out the full episode, be sure to check out that. Josina does great work. And Earl was a guy that was a great player. I mean, he is one of the better safeties of all time when it comes down to it. But, you know, he's not the best safety of all time. To me, he you could argue, you know, is he in top 10 conversations? You could argue that, right? Top five, I'm sure he would argue that. Well, he argues that he's better than a couple of greats. He said he's better than Ed Reed and he's better than Troy Palomalu. And if you saw Josina Anderson's face when he said this, she was like, oh, 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 like what? So the full thing was kind of how he would react if he wasn't a first ballot Hall of Famer. Because obviously Earl had a very decorated career, Super Bowl champion, all pros, pro bowler, like very, very good, really good over the course of his career. And Earl was asked by Josina again, like, what would your reaction be if you weren't a first ballot Hall of Famer? He said, I I, quote, I would just know that I'm better than Ed Reed. I'm better than Troy Palomalu. That would be that. They got to know my game. I know a lot of Seattle fans would agree. I know for sure that 2013 team, we don't want a Super Bowl without me. We don't go back without me either. And so people, I saw this graphic floating everywhere on social media. People did the side-by-side comparison of Earl Thomas and Ed Reed. And let's just say it's not necessarily a super pretty picture for Earl when compared to Ed Reed. I mean, look. Earl had a great career. Did he have an Ed Reed career? No, not even close. So 
people brought this up. Earl ended up being 2-0 and against Ed over the course of his career, but that really doesn't matter. The only things that Earl Thomas had over Ed Reed were forced fumbles. He had one more forced fumble than Ed did, and that's it. I mean, they were tied in championships, if, if you want to put it that way, too. He had 34 more interceptions, Ed Reed did, than Earl Thomas. He had five more return touchdowns than Earl Thomas did. Four more sacks, Ed Reed, over Earl Thomas Two more Pro Bowls, three more All Pros. I just, you know, Ed Reed played more games. Ed Reed had more tackles. He played in 34 more games and had a lot more tackles than Earl Thomas did. I 534 compared to 497, not as big of a gap as I thought, but still, that's more. Earl Thomas is not better than Ed Reed. All right, I just want I want to put that out there right now, so there is no confusion what I'm saying and what I mean here. Straight up, Earl Thomas. Not better than Ed Reed. I just want to put that out there right now. Now, there's still a bunch of other comments we have to get to here. Because for Earl, he also had this very interesting comment on the 2019 Ravens and kind of how that dynamic was on that team. Because obviously that was Lamar's first year as a starter. And that's really when Lamar came into his own, you know, 36 touchdowns compared to six interceptions. And that defense was great, too. Right. And Earl had a very big part to play in that. I don't want to gloss over it and say that Earl Thomas had nothing to do with that defense being good because he was extremely good on the field. And I've been consistent in saying that ever since 2019. Right. I was doing my first season doing this show was 2019. And I continuously said, look, Earl was great on the field for the Ravens off the field. It was just a disaster. So Earl was asked about that. And he said, quote, we only lost two games that season. Lamar Jackson, he's Lamar Jackson, but I'm Earl Thomas, and I made sure the whole team knew that. I'm, I'm kind of listening to this, and I'm like, what does that mean? Like, that that can mean so many different things. I mean, yeah, you know, you let the team know who you were by punching Chuck Clark in practice, which we will get to in a minute here because he did talk about that. But, like, you, you let the team know? I mean, yeah, did he go up to the team and say, hey, I'm I'm the best, apparently, because you know he thinks he's better than Enrique Troy Palomalu. Like, what what are we doing here? You know, Lamar. Look, he said Lamar's Lamar, but I just I don't I don't really understand what what was going on in that locker room because I, I don't know. He was talking a lot too about getting back into the game. You know, maybe coaching play. I don't, there was a lot in this conversation to unpack. Like it it. I, this was not expected. I haven't thought about Earl Thomas in a really long time. I'm not sure if anybody else had. I mean, it's kind of like a, a blast from the past. Signed him to a big deal and obviously had to eat a lot of that money because it was just not good whatsoever on the field or off the field. Excuse me, off the field. It's again, on the field, it was great. But he was doing everything for that Ravens defense. And it was kind of, it was a bummer that it didn't work out off the field. But there was always this kind of weird vibe behind Earl that felt like for a lot of people. I think a lot of people kind of sensed that something was off. You didn't really fit into what the Ravens culture was. And yeah, obviously we now know that that is the case based off of what happened. But Earl Thomas did admit that punching Chuck Clark in practice was a mistake. He wasn't necessarily apologetic for it, but he did say it was a mistake. He said, quote, when I punched somebody in practice, that was definitely a mistake. I mean, you see fights all the time in training camp. You see fights all the time in training camp. I, they understand. So, again, he addressed it, said it was a mistake, but didn't necessarily, didn't necessarily go in, in too much, too much more detail on that based off of what I was able to, to see. But then he also said he wants to see his jersey, you know, still in Baltimore, still in the stands, said, quote, I definitely want to see my jersey in the stands in the arena. I want to see a number 29 jersey in Baltimore because they know – I'm good. I don't know how many people have that 29 year old Thomas Jersey laying around. I'm sure some people do remember there was this whole thing when Marlon was 29 about how Earl wanted 29 and the Marlon moved to 44. And obviously that's honoring Marlon's dad. So it, it worked out, but Earl wanted that 29 and he got it. And then, you know, kind of all went, uh, all went up in flames after that. So Earl Thomas blast from the past type of name. Didn't necessarily expect to be talking about him here in the year 2024, but hey, he uh, he opted on Josina Anderson's podcast. And again, if you want to go check out the full interview, be sure to check out the exhibit. 
with Justina Anderson. First episode for Justina. She got Earl Thomas on there. Also Drake May, who I think is going to be a heck of a quarterback in this league for a long time. And someone the Ravens will see moving forward. But coming up in the second part of the show, we'll talk about Stephen A. Smith continuing to bash Lamar Jackson and just what is going on and why this continues to happen and what he had to say. Stay tuned. We'll have to get to on the show. First, the show is brought to you by Mint Mobile. With big wireless providers, what you see is never what you get. Somewhere between the store and your first month's bill, the price you thought you were paying magically skyrockets. With Mint Mobile, you'll never have to worry about gotchas ever again. When Mint Mobile says $15 a month when you purchase a three-month plan, they mean it. And sometimes you could have bad experiences with other mobile providers, such as complicated bills, fees, upcharges, and more. How great is it that Mint Mobile is straight up? Say goodbye to your overpriced wireless plans, jaw-dropping monthly bills, and unexpected overages. Because Mint Mobile is here to rescue you with premium wireless plans starting at 15 bucks a month. Ditch overpriced wireless with Mint Mobile's deal. You get three months of premium wireless service for 15 bucks a month. To get this new customer offer and your new three-month premium wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month, go to mintmobile.com slash lockdownNFL. That's mintmobile.com slash lockdownNFL. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash lockdownNFL. $45 upfront payment required, equivalent $15 a month. New customers on first three-month plan only. Speed slower, above 40 gigabytes on a limited plan. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. And the show is brought to you by FanDuel. Get ready to tackle the NFL action with FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook, because right now, new customers can bet $5 and get 150 in bonus bets if you win. The FanDuel Sportsbook gap gives you everything you need to place live bets on the NFL all in one place. So to get 100 in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats for that play-by-play and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. Just visit FanDuel.com to join today. You can start with $150 of bonus bets if you win your first $5 bet. That's FanDuel.com. Never waste to hunt and make every moment more of FanDuel an official sports book partner of the NFL. We're back for our second segment, Locked on Ravens. Kevin Allstriker still here with you on this Saturday edition of the show. Hopefully everybody's enjoying their Weekend so far, big game coming up for the Ravens tomorrow as they will face off against the Pittsburgh Steelers in Pittsburgh. So Ravens have an opportunity to take over first place in the AFC North. Just as a reminder, we'll be going live after that game, talking everything that happened, win, lose, hopefully not a tie. Again, we do not like ties over here on Locked on Ravens, but win or lose or tie. We'll go on live talking about everything in that game. You should hit that like and subscribe button. Video form, audio form. It's the same show either which way. Just hit 9,000 subscribers. Creeping up towards 10,000 now. We're less than 650 away. So if you want to be on that journey to 10K, be sure to hit that like and subscribe button on YouTube. And in audio form, be sure to follow along and subscribe over there as well. That community is growing at a rapid pace as well. Now, Stephen A. Smith. Oh, Stephen A. Smith. So we talked a lot about him yesterday again with Sam and Joku, and I'll bring up those comments again as we move forward in the segment. But Stephen A. has been on this Lamar Jackson bashing tour, and it's not just isolated into these past two days. This has been kind of a common theme for Stephen A. recently, and honestly, dating back a little while now. And it's unfortunate because you know Stephen A. has come to Lamar's defense before, but it just it doesn't appear to be happening as often anymore, and seems like Stephen A kind of just takes every opportunity to bash him. And it's even gotten to the point, as we talked about yesterday, with the whole slander type deal, where you don't use the word slander lightly, but Lamar came out and literally on Twitter himself said, what are you talking about, man? Like, what are you saying? Because Stephen A apparently made up this claim about Lamar's camp texting him about MVP stuff and saying, oh, you know, Dan's, Dan Orlovsky's right and you're wrong. Lamar's the MVP all day. That makes Lamar look bad. That makes Lamar's team look bad. And if that never happened, that is slander. Like that is like, that makes Lamar look bad. And so Lamar came out, said that didn't happen with the, uh, with the, with the cap tweet and said, my camp, what are you talking about? But so Stephen A again, went on ESPN and everybody was talking about the player that, was the most impactful to the Ravens and Steelers matchup on Sunday. So he's going to be got Kyle Hamilton and Russell Wilson was picked and George Pickens. And then Cam Newton picked Lamar Jackson, went to Lamar's defense, went in for Lamar. Cam said, you know, doesn't matter. Lamar's the guy. Lamar's the one that has all the fingerprints on this matchup. And he's the one that dictates everything. And, you know, Cam said, Stephen A, take that however you want to. And Stephen A went, 
off about how Lamar, you know, he can't beat the Chiefs. He can't beat the Steelers. He's like 65 and 18 against everybody else, but he's what, one and three as a starter against the Steelers and one and five against Patrick Mahomes or whatever it is. And he's just like, Lamar has two Achilles heels. It's Mahomes and the Steelers, Mahomes and the Steelers. And just kept going off about how he can't beat these teams. And again, like nothing in sight. And Cam Newton said, okay, a familiarity where, you know, we talk about this with the NFC teams, the more plays and why he's so good against the NFC is because teams don't see him well against Pittsburgh. They see him a decent amount as do Cleveland and, and Cincinnati, but Lamar has those guys numbers, but it can be difficult, you know, to play a team over and over again and not have them figure out some stuff. Now the thing about Lamar Jackson this year, the Steelers are not faced a player like that, but I mean, what if Lamar goes out there tomorrow and dominates? I'm not saying it's going to happen, but, like, what if it does? Because there's a possibility it does. Is Stephen A going to walk that back? I mean, I don't – at this point, it doesn't feel likely. It just feels like he's going to go out there and and try to find a new way to, to bash him. So, at the end of the day, like, it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter what Stephen A says. I mean, the MVP – is going to go to Lamar unless something crazy happens, something that he, again, yesterday or two days ago, tried to say, oh, well, hey, maybe Jared Goff can get back in the conversation, even though he threw those five interceptions, if he has a great six games. And Dan Orlovsky is like, that's ridiculous. Like, again, Stephen A is just getting wrecked on by former quarterbacks, Dan Orlovsky being one, Cam Newton being another. Those guys are coming to Lamar's defense. Dan Olasky said the MVP was always Lamar. It was never Jared Goff. And Stephen A was like, what's ridiculous? What's ridiculous? It, it's that type of thing. So, again, it doesn't matter what Stephen A says, right? But it, it's just an interesting – because all of these people, for example, Colin Cowherd's a good example of this, right? He was a big Lamar hater when he came out of college and for the first couple of years. But he apologized for his takes. He admitted he was wrong. And has now been one of Lamar's biggest defenders and goes to bat for Lamar seemingly every single chance that he gets. And, you know, it seems like some people are so stuck in their way about criticizing Lamar, you know, talking about him one way, but not about somebody else the other way. It's just, it's that type of thing. I think it's just like, what are we doing here? I'm, I'm fine for criticism when it's due. I d we do it here on this show when there is criticism for Lamar due when he makes bad decisions or has bad games or this, that, and that. We talk about it, right? But this like unfounded narrative creation and like, for example, with the, with the Lamar's camp thing, just making up stuff just to make stuff up or whatever the reason was. Cause again, with that thing, that does happen. There, there, is, there are players that have their teams reach out to media people and say, Hey, Either, you know, we'll give you this or can you help us out with this? You know, can you talk about our guy? Like that does happen. But Lamar is not a guy that would do that. Like I just, even if Lamar didn't say anything, it's so, it's so hard to believe in the first place. Like when that clip first went out, everyone was like, okay, there's no way this is true. And then Lamar confirmed it. And we're like, yeah, okay. Like we, we knew that, but like, why, what's the deal? So again, Lamar went in a Super Bowl. Lamar winning playoff games, Lamar, I guess, in Stephen A's case, beating the Steelers and the Chiefs. Those are all things that he can do to, you know, shut the critics up and, you know, have them meet their words. But there's always going to be something with Lamar. And it's it's just something that I've, I've I accepted it a long time ago, right? I accepted that a long time ago. But the thing that they can't take away from him is he's one of the best quarterbacks in the league. He's on his way to his third MVP. He is the best quarterback in the league this year, by the way. There's no debate about it. And he's going to be in top 10 conversations with a third MVP and with a Super Bowl. Ooh, a lot of people who don't like Lamar are not going to like those conversations, but I'm going to love him. And I think a lot of other people are going to love him. I'm talking about Lamar in that way. But coming up in the final part of the show, Ravens and Steelers has been a rivalry for ages, and it's been a great one. We'll talk about the meaning of the game, and not just from a rivalry perspective, but for both teams moving forward for this season, potentially proceeding in AFC North right. Stay tuned. We'll have to get to on the show. First, the show is brought to you by Hillsdale College. 
Time is the most precious commodity, so don't waste it scrolling through the same mind-numbing content for hours and hours. How can you spend it wisely to improve yourself? Our sponsor, Hillsdale College, is offering more than 40 free, that's right, free online courses, including Constitution 101, Introduction to Free Market Economics, and so much more. If you want a course on the Great American Story, Hillsdale has that for you as well. All of Hillsdale's courses are self-paced so that you can start whenever and tune in wherever. Plus, you can go deeper with readings, quizzes, discussions, or just enjoy the lectures. Go right now to hillsdale.edu slash locked on to enroll. There's no cost, and it's easy to get started. That's hillsdale.edu slash locked on to register. Hillsdale that edu slash locked on we're back here our final segment locked on ravens kevin Ostriker still here with you saturday episode bonus edition of the show appreciate everybody again for being here today and be sure to tell a friend tell a family member about locked on ravens here word of mouth still a thing right we promote the show on social media that's a huge thing but word of mouth is not gone so if you have a friend or a family member who is a ravens fan or just wants daily ravens coverage send them over our way here on locked on ravens appreciate the every dayers who tune in every single day if you're new to the channel welcome in and if you're somewhere in the middle welcome back to the show now this ravens and steelers game has a lot of meaning obviously first from just a rivalry perspective we know what this rivalry means i know that a lot of people think it has lost some juice and look back in the day those were the days you know you got Ben Roethlisberger, Ed Reed, Troy Palomalu, Joe Flacco, Ray Lewis, you know, Heinz Ward, everybody. Uh, those were hard hitting back when, you know, there weren't as many rules and you kind of just could go hit somebody and there wasn't worry of a, of a flag or something like that. Obviously, the rules have changed and obviously player safety is, is very important. And so, you know, a lot of the hits that we saw back in the earlier days of this rivalry would not fly today. But I think we're now seeing some juice reignited back into this thing with obviously Patrick Queen being on the other side and him feeling a type of way about how his situation was handled. He got other former Ravens over there to Sean Elliott, the Anthony Averitts on their practice squad, Jeremiah Moon, if you want to really dig deep into those, those guys on their roster. But then you have Arthur Millette and Deontay Johnson over on the Ravens side. And Two teams that I think respect each other, but obviously don't like each other. And the clip that I keep going back to is the one Ed Reed showing up after he was done playing. Speaking of Ed Reed, we talked about it in the first part of the show, but he showed up and I think, it, who was it? Someone was wearing a jersey. It was Lamar's rookie year or second year. I can't remember who was wearing the, the Steelers jersey, but he said, I hate that jersey you have on. Like These guys can't stand the Steelers and the Steelers can't stand the Ravens. And that's something... That is lost in today's game, I think, especially when you're talking about the era, you know, rivalries aren't necessarily, they don't feel as much like rivalries anymore, right? Like the Bears Packers or uh, all these other ones. Raven Steelers is the one where if you, if you were to ask me, like, what's the best rivalry in sports? I'm saying it's Raven Steelers. And, you know, is that because, you know, I've watched this Ravens team forever and, you know, I, I grew up with that rivalry and it, uh, yeah, partially, but I think you ask a lot of different people and that rivalry, you, you can name tons of moments from it, right? Hard hitting moments, big heartbreaking losses and big wins on both sides. So I think when you talk about this rivalry, I'm excited for this game in particular on Sunday because over the past couple of seasons, it hasn't felt as much like a rivalry, right? It still is Steelers week. It still is that, and it's still really exciting regardless. But to have that rivalry feel back, and I think the Ravens want this one, by the way. Like I, I think they want this one badly because I think they understand what has happened. They're one and seven over the last eight games against Pittsburgh. Lamar has not been able to figure out that defense over the course of his career. Lamar has not started two consecutive games against the Steelers in the course of his career. And that has a lot of that, you know, there, there are multiple reasons for that. You know, Ravens resting their starters in week 18, Lamar's injured, but it's something that I think Lamar probably is, is thinking about. And I know that, you know, you kind of downplay it. If you're the Ravens saying, Oh, it's just another week, but it's Steelers week. I, I think this game has meaning. And I think the Ravens really want to win this game. Like, obviously you want to win every game, but this one has more meaning because it's the Steelers because it's a divisional game and because of the history recently that this Ravens team has had against Pittsburgh, which has not been in their favor. So they want to go out there and they want to win this game. Like, I'm just going to say that th all right, this might be a hot take. I think they might want to win this game more than they wanted to win Kansas City in week one. That's my hot take. That's my hot take. Because here's the thing. Week one against Kansas City in the grand scheme of things didn't necessarily matter. 
Like, it would have been great if they won, obviously, for head-to-head and all that stuff. Like, they wanted to win that game. But the game that matters against the Chiefs was always going to be in January, right? Regular season week one game, you know, you get the storylines from the championship game last year and all the all the, all the the fanfare, com- really just diving into that. But we all know that the game that matters against Kansas City is in January. For this game, I think that the Ravens really want to win this one as much if not more than that Kansas City game. So I'm not saying the Ravens didn't want to win the Kansas City game and didn't want to win it badly. They obviously did, and Lamar clearly wanted to get that game, right? I'm not saying Lamar clearly wanted to beat Mahomes. But I think that he wants to win this game too. And so my bold take here is that the Ravens are going to go out there and they're going to throw everything out on the table, which I think you should do against division opponents, against NFC teams, this, that, and the other. You don't have to do all that necessarily. But division games matter, especially when you have the Steelers coming in at 7-2, and two, Ravens at 7-3. and three. This is for first place in the North right now, and it would kick Pittsburgh off with their divisional record at 0-1. Right, I think that's something that really is an underrated aspect here. Pittsburgh has not played a divisional game yet. Baltimore, this will be their fourth of the season. They're two and one right now. Three and one in the division is huge because obviously when it comes to tiebreakers, you got head to head, divisional, like all that stuff matters. AFC conference record, as I've said, and that's why the loss to Cleveland hurts so much when it happened. AFC North losses are the hardest losses to take because you, you lose ground in the division, you lose ground in your conference. That's really tough. NFC losses are kind of like, yeah, they're losses, right? You lose a spot in the loss column, but it's almost like whatever. Now, Lamar just dominates against the NFC, so you know, you're not really expecting an NFC loss. I mean, again, he's lost one game to the NFC. But to the, in this regard, I mean, this game means so much in a lot of different aspects, especially because you're going to see this team again relatively soon, and you want to establish good habits here. And I think the Ravens will. I mean, my prediction is they win. I think they win this game, and I think they win it by a touchdown. I said 31-24 is, I believe, my prediction. That's what I'm going to stick with here. So I think Baltimore's offense played at a historic pace. I think they continue that against a very formidable Steelers defense. But I think that even, hey, you know what? Maybe the Ravens defense bounces back a little bit in ways. Maybe the secondary, maybe the pass rush. So big, big game upcoming for this Baltimore Ravens team. That's all I have for you here today on Locked on Ravens. Thank you so much for tuning in to the show. Coming up tomorrow, we'll be back here with our game day preview episode, 6 a.m. Eastern time. So be sure on the way out, hit that like and subscribe button in video form. Follow along, subscribe in audio form as well. And I'll see you right back here tomorrow on Locked on Ravens.